my name is Kat Caswell. I am the Small Acreage Management Specialist for CSU Extension in cooperation with the NRCS. Um, and today I am talking about general how to interpret a soil test and how to take some soil health measurements. Good, yes, yeah. so I'm Kat. I am the Small Acreage Management Specialist for the Front Range region. So I'm actually a partner position between CSU Extension and NRCS. Um, which means I get to follow both the state regulations and the federal regulations at the same time. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. Um, who would tell my bosses I said that? Oh, right, I'm standing distance away. Sorry, that's become a really bad force of habit, um, or a really good force of habit. So I have done the thing to you that I hate when workshops do. I handed you a stack of papers. Um, and on the front is even more papers you can go online and find. So soil health in general, soil management, isn't something you can do in just two hours. It's something people literally spend their entire life studying. What's really cool about soil health is we're learning so many new things every year. We've got faculty across the country, academics, farmers, government agencies who are all working on how to preserve our soil and how to remediate or regenerate, however you want to phrase it. Um, we're getting a lot of really, really cool soil stuff. So we're learning a lot of stuff. So just some general stuff on here. There's some really great resources from CSU. Since those of you are small farmers, uh, we do have a small farm extension agent who is Adrian Card in the Boulder office. And they have some really great small farm resources along with veggies. Um, and then just some other good stuff. And there's also at the bottom there is the NRCS uh, crop in field soil health assessments, which I do have copies of with me if you want to grab it. Um, it's a bit of a thick document, but it's got some really good tests in there. Most of what we're going to be doing today, you can uh, have directions for and can re be repeatable with that field assessment and you can do yourself at home. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, you can take home and do yourself tomorrow um, or something you can start in the future. So no, no overly fancy tools, no overly fancy gadgets. And that's kind of the fun thing about what NRCS has been developing, about what a lot of farmers are doing on their own farms, is because we're learning how to do all of this and learning the lab tests, sometimes it's just the observational data that you take every year is really getting a lot of knowledge for you, even if you don't want to spend $70 for a PLFA test. So that is all on there. So kind of the agenda real quick. Um, I just realized. So just so you know, I did I work. I have my master's degree in agronomy. My background is kind of a weird blend of conventional large farm work and also small uh, acreage management and small farming. So most of the farming I did was diversified livestock operations and managing grazing. And I really love chickens. So I do actually have a minor in poultry science. So if you want me to talk about chicken manure, that can be a whole three hours of me rambling. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Um, so I kind of kind of tell people where I'm coming from. I, I did originally go to Penn State. So I've been out in the Western States for about five years now. So I was working for CSU on some dryland cover crop grazing, then in Western Nebraska, and I've bopped back here. So I always kind of feel weird when somebody gets up and starts just rambling at you and you're like, I have no idea where you're coming from. Where? So that's kind of, if you want to pick on me for being an East Coaster, that's fine. Um, so in the beginning, of your packet, we'll kind of work through our way through how to read a soil test. Um, I've got different examples of a conventional fertility test along with some soil health tests. So we've got examples of the Haney test from two different labs, uh, PL PLFA, which is the phospholipid fatty acids, try saying that three times fast, and then the TDN test, which is kind of like cutting edge brand new. We've got three different labs represented in there. Um, so just in case you forget, we always have the handy dandy CSU fact sheet and how to read a soil test. So we'll run through these, uh, go through any questions, and then we'll get to some hands-on field demos. We'll get to look at some fun stuff and pick soil apart. So your first one you have in there is if you've ever sent in a farm test, um, a farm soil test from CSU, this is probably what you've gotten back. And it's a really fun Excel spreadsheet that gives you just some numbers and not much else. Um, so CSU Soil Lab is, they are very reliable, they're very good. They're a little bit delayed this year uh, because they're a process of moving labs and their director just retired. So they have a fantastic new director, but of course getting 
everybody caught back up to speed. So right now for farm testing, they're not giving recommendations, but they are giving you just your test results. So if you're looking at just a standard agricultural test, um, when you sent it in, obviously you're going to include all of your data. So what sample it is, what field it is, the date that you took it on and then the depth you took it to. So you're going to put that both on your sample. You will send to the lab on your sample bag and also write it down for yourself. Um, it's really easy for numbers to get flipped and confused and switched. So just keep as many records as you can. Take pictures of what the field looked like when you took your samples. This lab doesn't necessarily need your soil depth that you took it to. It is handy for you to know that though, especially when you're going to be interpreting your results. Um, additionally, if you are only taking a sample kind of like for backyard production or vegetable production, most of our available nutrients when we plant, when we're really worried about getting those starts going and getting fertilizer to the plants as quickly as possible, is that top zero to six inches. Um, you can test zero to eight is kind of common if you're going to be looking at towards the plow layer. And then you can also do zero to 12 inches. Um, zero to 12 inches isn't necessarily required if you're going to be doing more kind of horticultural. If you're going to be doing more row crops, if you're gonna be doing corn, wheat, sorghum, and you wanna have an idea of how deep those nutrients are, if you're planning on having a really deep rooted crop and you want it to access those extra nutrients further down, then it might be appropriate to do uh, depth 12 inches. If you read some scientific literature, if you get really into some of the soil science, we do have methods of taking core, soil cores down to about 36 inches, up to four feet. Um, you'll need specialized equipment for that. So on your typical farm, unless you're getting into uh, academic research, you don't really need to worry about those depths, but it is a lot of fun. Um, the only other reason you need to take a deeper uh, sample to 12 inches is if you know, if you either have a compaction layer in there, if you have a plow layer, or you know you have a texture shift. So if you know your top six inches is a, is a loam or a clay, and if your bottom six inches switches to a sand layer, then you might want to consider splitting that into a zero to six and then a seven to 12 inch, uh, just because you'll need to accommodate for the fact that sand sometimes loses nutrients faster and then adjust your fertilizer rates for that. So on your actual handy dandy soil test, um, the first thing you'll see is your soil pH. So seven, if we're thinking about pH, which is kind of back to high school chemistry, seven is neutral. In the West, our soils tend to run more basic, so they are greater than seven. We don't really want to start worrying too much about the basicness of our soil until we're above about 8.3, 8.5. That's when we start seeing issues where plants can't survive. Um, some plants like our berry bushes, raspberry bushes, prefer slightly acidic soils, right? So if you ever see maple trees just not do really great out West, maple trees prefer around a 6.5 soil. We tend to have seven and above. I don't recommend sugar maple trees as a production out here. It's not gonna work for you. Um, so a lot of times, unless your soil is getting extreme above one of those ranges, you don't have to worry too much about your pH. We do have the um, electric conductivity for salts. So we do sometimes see sodic or high salt soils in Colorado. A lot of times it's effect of um, high salt content in our water. And if you are farming on a retired irrigation pivot or on a well, if there's been significant heavy irrigation over a long period of time, we tend to see the salts increase. And that's usually effect of both high salt water and also enough water over time is slowly pushing a lot of those nutrients further down to the soil. And it's just, it's like hard build up in your shower. It just gets salty and calcium. Um, a lot of times we want to add lime, we want to add calcium because we think it improves soil structure. You can't save a soil structure with lime. It's not, it, it's not a thing. I don't know where it came from. It's across the whole country. But if you do have high salty soils that you need to remediate, you can get a gypsum test done and get a recommendation for the amount of gypsum to add to kind of compensate for that excess salt. Um, Soil texture analysis at CSU is typically done by the hand method. Um, so pretty much they just make a ribbon. A soil scientist, there is an art to this. I am not somebody who possesses that, that very artistic skill. Um, if you want somebody to texture all your soils, I know some fantastic soil scientists who work with the National Soil 
registry. If you ever looked at a web soil survey and they have all those different soil types, yeah, there's people from the NRCS who that is their entire job is they just go to your field, take samples, make ribbons and tell you what type of soil it is. Um, that is all they do. <laughs> so many ribbons and sometimes they get a little crazy. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, I'm friends with one of them. She's very nice. Um, you do the hand method. We do see a lot of sandy loams and a lot of hard clays out here. We don't get those beautiful prairie soils. We're kind of pushing too close to the mountains for that. We are west of the 100th meridian line, so we get the less good soils and the less rain, uh, but we can still do pretty well out here. So then we kind of get into the, if you go from the organic matter over, this is your actual fertility test. Those are the actual nutrients that are available in your soil. So your first one there is organic matter. 4% um, is dang high for this part of the world. Typically we see below 3%. I've been on some farms that are down at like 0.5, 1% and they do not look great. Um, so typically if you've got a 4 or 4.1, we like organic matter to be between 3 to 5%. And organic matter is one of the things we spend a lot of time talking about with soil health, building our organic matter, um, how we can improve our organic matter. It's a very hot topic. It does a lot of great things for our soil. It improves our soil quality a lot. It improves the availability of our nutrients. It can help our nutrient cycling. Um, it helps our water holding capacity, which is a big deal in the Western part of the world. The Western part of this country, sorry. The, not all of the Western world, it's a big generalization. Um, but how organic matter interacts with your soil type and how you can get it to function in your soils is really going to vary by your specific field, your soil type and your region. Um, we, a lot of the soil health data that came out first and a lot of this information on compost and organic matter improvement has been coming out of the Midwestern and Eastern states as an East Coaster, of course, I take total credit for that. Um, but a lot of this cover crop data on how it improves organic matter and how do you increase organic matter is coming out of regions that have two or three times the amount of moisture that Colorado and Western Nebraska do. So how you're going to improve that if you're reading some of this really good soil health stuff, you're going to have to take it critically and think about it and modify it to what it's going to work with your uh, operation. For example, decomposition just does not happen at the same rate here. It is much, much slower. So if somebody's saying like, oh yeah, you can go get six ton of rye and it'll decompose within two years. No, slow that down. How that organic matter interacts and decomposes is going to impact how your nitrogen is going to be available to your soil. So if you have too high organic matter, which is primarily stable carbon, um, it's going to tie up a lot of that nitrogen, right? So four is good. Uh, kind of on a very sideways rant about organic matter. So the next thing, that really big one we want to think about is your nitrates. So on a conventional soil test for fertility, your nitrogen rate will be in organic nitrogen. So organic nitrogen is what's available to the plants immediately. So we talked about nitrogen. There's generally two general categories we put them in. We put them in inorganic nitrogen and organic nitrogen. So this isn't, you know, this is not like artificially made nitrogen versus uh, naturally produced nitrogen. This is the actual structure of the nitrogen compounds that are present in the soil. So nitrate nitrogen, which is NO3 NH, NO3 minus N, uh, is the most available form to plants. So if you are using a conventional fertilizer, it's usually NPK. It's typically in the form of nitrate nitrogen. Uh, so that's immediately available, and that's typically given to you in parts per million. Depending on what lab you use, the conversion from your parts per million to your pounds per acre might vary. There's different extraction methods that different labs, labs use. So typically I recommend that all farmers stick, pick a lab in your region and stick to it, um, mostly because it'll be consistent from year to year. If somebody's using a different extraction method, if you apply those same conversions to that test, you're going to get an inaccurate number. It's especially important to think about that with your phosphorus amounts. So different labs in different regions will use different phosphorus extraction methods um, and how those extraction methods work. If you use the wrong one for the wrong type of soils, you're going to get an inaccurate results for your extraction. 
So Colorado is calibrated to Colorado soils. Western Nebraskan labs um, and Midwestern labs are pretty, don't you, don't go further east in Nebraska, pretty much. Soils are really similar in Nebraska and there's labs, there's three major soil labs already in Nebraska that you can utilize um, that are, are similar quality to CSU. So then we have our phosphorus, which is our other big nutrient to worry about. We're typically not low in phosphorus in Colorado. Um, it's a very stable nutrient, it stays where you put it. And that is another one that has a typical, I forgot the conversion factor. But it's another one you'll have to convert um, yourself. And then we go into our micronutrients. So potassium is a macronutrient, but then we kind of go through our zinc, iron, magnesium, calcium, boron, and sulfur. So we don't really see micronutrients become a huge issue unless they are dramatically low. And typically there is a rating. So if you go back to your, your handy dandy CSU extension sheet, they give you two tables on the back that will tell you if you're adequate or low. So we get, we get kind of focused on our micronutrients sometimes a little bit more than we really need to. Um, a lot of times if you're applying compost, if you're doing good soil management, unless your soil is prone to say boron depletion, you don't have to worry about micronutrients so much. Um, and a lot of times you can treat it on a field by field basis. It's not necessarily a huge, a huge, huge situation. Um, we might see a sulfur shortage if you have sodic soils and it gets tied up with the calcium and then you can treat that with gypsum. So on the bottom line here, uh, they will, CSU will give you a conversion for actual pounds per acre of that nutrient. So a lot of our fields in Colorado do tend to be kind of low in nitrogen. We do have to fertilize a good bit. And there's a couple of different approaches you can take when it comes to fertilization. It's completely up to you, your operation, what you're using, what your management style is. Um, you can, a lot of places, a lot of recommendations will be to apply the amount of nitrogen your crop will need for the year, and that's it. Uh, you can also apply what you need plus extra if your soil is particularly low and you need to kind of raise your, your nutrient levels up to sort of a baseline. How you approach that's going to be up to you. What recommendations you want to use are going to be up to you. Um, CSU does have recommendations for both row crops and veggie crops, which are all available on our extension website. There's some more thick documents. And those are, as we're learning more and more about soil and how soil interacts with microorganisms and organic matter, uh, they're kind of regularly updating fertility adjustments and fertility recommendations. So CSU is actually working on some new recommendations that should be coming out relatively soon. I don't know. U.S. soil scientists, and it's, who knows. Um, so the next one is a really quick example of, so CSU also offers just sort of home and garden and landscaping. It's very much the same. These are typically a little bit more streamlined because this is geared more towards uh, homeowners or small areas. Um, and with those, they're typically still offering some recommendations. Um, and it's ideally the same thing, and they will kind of give you more suggestions of what plant type would be appropriate to plant there, and if you need to add any extra nutrients or not. So, you can flip through that really quick. And then finally, our last one from CSU is going to be uh, a compost test. So I included in here, largely because I will sometimes forget, uh, just a quick primer on how to read your major nutrients from a compost test. You don't have to read it right now, it's just kind of there if you have thoughts about it later because uh, the next page is our... Please flip. Yeah! <laughs> so, soil amendments are fantastic. I have yet to leave a farm where I'm not like, you applying manure? You should think about manure. Um, there's lots of fun, inappropriate word jokes I can make about that, but I'm being recorded, so I won't. Uh, compost tests, if you're buying large commercial compost, a lot of times they will not provide analysis with it. If you plan on using it at large acres, I would recommend either requesting a compost test from them or paying for one yourself. Um, a lot of times there could, there could be different components, different nutrients in there that you're not expecting to be in excess or um, 
in a deficit that you were expecting to be there, especially if you have compost that's too high in its carbon to nitrogen ratio. So we've all probably made compost. We all talk about the browns and greens, do to do to do, right? If we have a compost that's too high in nitrogen, uh, sorry, too high in carbon, which if you had a compost that's really high in wood chips or really high in dead leaves, if those aren't fully broken down, it's going to be a very large carbon chain that's very stable. That's gonna be stuck in, those com stuck in that compost that you're about to put on your soil, especially if your soil is already low in nitrogen. So for those compounds to break that down, so if you think about those large carbon chains of really fibrous plants, a lot of wood chips, that's what gives them those really nice lignin structures. Um, to break down those carbon chains, it requires nitrogen. So those decompositions is just gonna reach out, grab your nitrogen and tie it up. So maybe you think you've applied enough nitrogen, you didn't realize your compost was too high in carbon, you now have a nitrogen deficit that you don't see until midway through the season. And now you're scrambling to try to find a way to get nitrogen onto your plants, which is a bit more complicated for veggies than it is for corn, right? So it's a little bit easier to side dress corn than it is tomatoes. Um, so your carbon to nitrogen ratio is gonna be one of those first things that you kinda wanna look at, your total percentage of carbon. And these are handy. I'm not gonna make you read every single number today, but there is also some quick reference tables on the back of these, All right? The other thing we want to think about besides our carbon is our nitrogen. So when we apply compost or manure, uh, we can either apply it at a nitrogen rate or the phosphorus rate. So if you apply compost or manure to meet your season's need for nitrogen, you are going to be applying way in excess of phosphorus. If you apply it to the rate to meet that season's need of phosphorus, you're going to be under applying nitrogen and then you're going to, need to supplement it with an additional fertilizer. It's kind of pick your poison sort of things. Most people apply at the rate of that season's nitrogen needs. And a lot of manure applications does this because you don't need to add another nitrogen source. And that tends to be more expensive, but we do tend to see uh, great excessive phosphorus. So if you're from the East Coast, if you heard of the Chesapeake Bay, total daily total limit. I wrote a paper on this, I should really remember it. Um, <laughs> it's because there's a lot of swine and dairy farms and poultry farms on the Eastern coast that apply manure at the rate of end rate for years and years and years and years. And now there's a huge phosphorus runoff, right? A lot of our algal blooms, um, duckweed pollution isn't nitrogen, it's phosphorus. So uh, we don't have as much of that issue in Colorado. We have fields that can be really, really high in phosphorus, but we don't have as dramatic of a runoff issue. You will never have to add additional phosphorus if you're using really heavy compost and manure sources, um, just because you always have a lot. applying manure to that field that is really the basic sure sure um so Taylor's question was if you have a pasture that you're applying manure or compost to and you kind of just see your phosphorus going up and up and up and up um is there a point where you'd have to kind of cut off and remediate it or grow a crop to mine it out um the best recommendation is to stop applying to that field um switch to a commercial fertilizer if you can. At that point, your nitrogen is probably pretty stable. And especially if it's a pasture, a lot of times if it's a dryland pasture here, we don't need to fertilize it for nitrogen yearly. Um, if it's irrigated, you might want to do a split application once, twi twice a year in the spring. If it's a dry land, you shouldn't be needing to add nitrogen to it um, annually. So I would just recommend not applying for at least a few years. Phosphorus is a very stable nutrient. It likes to stay where we put it. It will stay if we apply it kind of in a band. We know that if you go two inches away from that band, it won't have moved even two inches over time. Um, my recommendation would just be to leave it alone. <laughs> um, the plants will take up some of it over time. You should, if you do not apply uh, any additional ones, you should slowly start to see that go down. You can, especially if you're in a watershed, you can start to see phosphorus runoff and pollution if you have kind of that excess continuing over time. That's really the best 
the best recommendation. I mean, there are some like buckwheat as a cover crop is a really great phosphorus scavenger. Um, cereal rye is a really good phosphorus scavenger. Both buckwheat and cereal rye you have to be careful with, um, especially if you're around a wheat farmer. Buckwheat is not, I don't want to say it's banned, it's not an approved cover crop, especially if you're in a wheat field, you'll lose um, any financial incentives you have because there, we export a lot of our wheat to Asia and it, there's worry about contamination with the buckwheat into the wheat crop. Um, cereal rye is the same because it's just such a similar crop to wheat. It kind of tends to become a weed and then contaminate your wheat, which if you're taking your wheat to an elevator, you'll get docked if you have uh, rye contamination and around here, buckwheat contamination. But there are some cover crops. If you're not growing wheat crop, it's a little bit flexible. Yeah. Question sure. on um, the carbon ratio of the compost. Um, and does that change when you have a higher fungal content in the compost? Like, can you get away with a high, higher carbon t content if you have more uh, of a fungal ratio in that compost or if it was given time or inoculated? I do not have a solid answer for that. Um, if you give it, if you give any very structured carbon enough time, it will break down like a decaying log, right? Um, I'm honestly not sure. I cannot think of anything that would give me a science, like a science backed answer to that. My concern, if you, my thoughts, if you, if it's stable, if you can leave it there for longer and let the fungus continue breaking it down, that carbon to nitrogen ratio should even out and come down if you leave it for longer and it has enough of a nitrogen source in there. So if you keep adding some green leaves to it, it should come down. I wouldn't recommend applying it to a field if it's at that stage, just because I'm not, I'm not sure it would, the fungus would be able to overcome that decomposition rate fast enough to make it safe for the field at that point. But I don't have a solid my contact info is on that sheet. So if you email me that question, I will do some research and get back to you because now it's gonna bug me until I know. Um, it's not a great answer, but I'll do some research. Um, cool, so then the, the next kind of major things you wanna look at in your organic uh, compost is your nitrogen rates, right? So on your compost analysis, your manure analysis, there will be a total nitrogen. So that includes both your organic and your inorganic nitrogen. So your organic, your inorganic nitrogen, so your ammonium nitrate um, will be available that season. The organic nitrogens, which should be the other, whatever percent it says there, 26.9 uh, tons, that will become available over time. So every year, some of that organic nitrogen pool will break down and be converted to inorganic nitrogen. So a lot of times when you're adding compost, you might not be getting all that nitrogen that year, so where it says total nitrogen. That's not gonna be all available to you in the first season, but it'll be more of a slow release over time, which is one of the reasons why we like compost because it kind of gives us a little bit more of that nitrogen credit every year and every year and every year. Um, it's gonna be the same thing for phosphorus. The plant available form will be that P2O5. So we do have organic phosphorus that kind of works the same way as organic nitrogen. Some will be available, the inorganic will be available that first year. The organic will be slowly available over time. And typically potassium um, will be a little bit higher in compost. We're not typically short of potassium in Colorado, but if you are, just pay attention to those rates. Um, and then there's of course included in there a lot of those micronutrients. So your compost, yeah. Um, sorry, I just had a quick sure, sure. So this, the question was, um, is this test specifically only for compost or can you use this test for soil pastures? pasture soil as well. Um, this test is specifically for soil amendments. So if you do this test, you can use for compost, um, manure, any things you'll be adding to your soil, you'll kind of get this same result back. We do have what you're essentially asking for in other forms of soil tests. So if you guys flip over two sheets to the one that says region ag on the front, and throwing things on the ground. So this is an example of the soil health Haney test. So this will get into that question about toil, uh, total carbon and total organic carbon. So the Haney test um, 
is a different extraction method than our kind of traditional soil fertility tests. And the Haney test was really developed to use a whole suite of different factors to give you a rating of your overall soil health. So kind of at the bottom, doo -doo -doo, under the soil health section, right before the cover crop suggestions where it says SHC, that is your soil, it's your soil health calculation. I forgot the last letter, that's why I wrote down. Yep, it's your soil health calculation. So that's on a scale of one to 50. Um, the scale itself is, is, it's based on, it was a man named Haney who developed the test. He developed the extraction methods um, and he kind of picked a scale of one to 50 as worst to best. And using the suite of tests that he performs, um, he picks you, put, puts that rating somewhere on a scale and it says now widely used across the country. So Regen Ag is a lab out of Buffalo County, Nebraska. I also included a copy of a test from Ward Labs, which is also in more central Nebraska. Um, it's done pretty commonly around the country. It was developed more towards Kansas, Eastern Kansas, I'm pretty sure at least. But yeah, so in your Haney test, they will give you again your nitrate nitrogen, your total organic nitrogen. So it'll be more like that compost test. will give you your total nitrogen, total organic nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen. They developed a test. They'll say how much of your organic nitrogen will actually be released that season. So this isn't from any soil amendments. This is the nitrogen that's actually sitting in your soil right now that hasn't just gone through the soil, whole nitrogen soil nutrient cycling process and converted back to an inorganic nitrogen. And then from there, it gives you an estimate of how much nitrogen should be available in your fields from that year, for that year. And the same thing with phosphorus, right? So that organic and released PPM, that's how much of that nitrogen credit will actually be released and available to your plants that year. So essentially what it's saying is you have this available pool, you have this inavailable pool, part of that inavailable pool will become available so you should make your fertilizer estimates based off of that larger pool. It's a bit more shifting back and forth. So it's the same, same kind of concept of how you would plan your manure or your compost rates, right? Um, again, we have soil pH, our percent organic matters in there, our micronutrients fertility, uh, for fertility, we have those. And then we have our soil respiration. So third, bar from the bottom, that first one is our soil respiration. So we want that number above 30. And essentially what they do is they take the soil, get it completely soaked, and then measure how much CO2 is um, emitted from that soil over a 24 hour period. So the idea is how much CO2 is emitted is how much respiration is happening from our soil microbes. So it's really a test of do you have microbes and are they actually not dead? Are they alive and functioning, right? Um, and from there, we calculate another organic carbon. And then we have the MAC percentage, which is the microbility available carbon. So how much carbon is available for your microbes to actually chomp on and eat. And then again, you have a carbon to nitrogen ratio within your soil. So within the carbon to nitrogen ratio, I kind of like to remind people in Colorado, if you're going to be using really fibrous cover crops, like if you're letting a cereal rye go really far, if you're adding wheat stalks to a field, um, then you might want to consider if your carbon to nitrogen ratio is too high, because if you add that extra carbon, you might further tie up that nitrogen. I need to add some su uh, supplemental, further tie up the carbon, will further... you'll need to add more nitrogen. <laughs> if you have too much carbon, add more nitrogen. Um, and then the SHC will be your soil health calculation. A lot of these tests do provide a cover crop suggestion. Ward will do the same thing. Uh, again, take those critically. Sometimes those suggestions are based on different regions with different soil types, with different moisture, avail moisture availability. Um, on a lot of our dry, 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 dry land fields, I've not seen a legume perform really well. More towards the front range on some of our smaller acreage and veggie farms, we can see that benefit from them. We can get some of that legume nitrogen credit, which is awesome. Um, but sometimes on our bigger, really dry fields, I tend to caution people away from legumes just because they are expensive. And if you're going to be seeding 70 acres with them, 
it's a lot of money to put up for something you're not going to get any return on. There's three tests in here that all kind of give you three different soils and they all are slightly different. So you can kind of look through there. It's a little brain experiment for yourself. Um, I had fun comparing them and kind of practicing going through and saying, okay, what's the first things that I see on here that's gonna give me pause and the first things that you can address. So that first one, it looks pretty good. Like I didn't look at this and say, oh dang, you're in trouble. I looked at it and said, yeah, you're doing okay. You're a little low on nitrogen. I expect that. But some of the other ones, especially on that second one, so it says Haney test number two, they have a soil organic matter that's down to two to 3%, 2.3%, sorry. And that's a little, I would say that's something you could work on right from the get-go is focusing on your soil percentage. And then they had a slightly low pH at 6.9, which isn't concerning, but I'm kind of, that gives me the first thought of, all right, you've got a soil pH that low in Colorado. All right, what are you, uh, what are you doing, dude? So <laughs> that's, sometimes you kind of see those things and that's one of your first thoughts. Um, the nitrogen isn't terrible. And then you kind of see that the soil respiration is a little bit lower. Your carbon to nitrogen ratio is okay. Sometimes it's, it's one of those things of like, um, I would want to go out and walk this field and try to say like, there's something, there's something hinky because one looks really great, one looks really bad. This is when I'd want to have a conversation with the landowner of like, what are you doing and what's, what are your strategies? Not aggressive, what are you doing? But like, let's, let's talk about it. We can make some improvements here. Um, I think that the soil health calculation list was only a 9.4, so it's not like a super accurate scale, right? That's a kind of an amalgamation of a lot of different factors. So there's something going on. Their soil health isn't great. Um, and number three is kind of the same. It's a number, uh, thing to go look at. So they've got a, still a relatively low soil health calculation there. And their soil respiration is kind of low, but the organic matter looks pretty good. So that's another one where I'd want to go out and actually walk the field with the landowner and figure out some long-term strategies. So different labs will run Haney tests a little bit different. So if you are interested in doing Haney tests, if you're interested in testing your factors for soil health, pick a lab and stick with it. Because that, that way you can compare your results year to year to year. So a lot of times you can make your fertilization recommendations and calculations off of the nutrients that are on these tests. That's completely reasonable. But some of those soil health factors, you kind of have to observe and go back every year. So sample at the same time, sample using the same method, use the same lab and use the same fields, right? So you can't, it's kind of difficult to compare across fields sometimes. Um, the key is to really be, be consistent. Um, especially when you're sampling. So you can kind of compare your soil tests from year to year to year, right? It works, it works best if you're comparing the same fields. It's a bit tricky to compare across different farms. Okay, any questions on the Haney test? I think they're, I think they're running about 35, 35, 40 right now. Um, they're a bit more expensive than a traditional fertility test. So traditional fertility tests, you'll want to run at least every three years. Um, my strategy is usually take your test, find where your baseline goal is going to be, and then plan your fertilization or your compost rates, or your manure rates over that three year period, and then sample again. Haney, you can do every year, but honestly, some of these factors will move so slowly. The organic matter, it'll be like 1% every 10 years. So I would kind of do them on the same rate. You might want to do a little bit longer, three to five years. Um, sometimes it's really difficult to shift that soil organic carbon pool um, and it, it's a little bit longer of a stretch. So they're, they're expensive, they're a really great management tool, a really great observational tool, um, but it doesn't have to be every single year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So pretty much all the labs will offer traditional testing in addition to the soil health test. So CSU does not currently have the Haney test. Um, Missouri State does. Missouri State also offers most of the kind of bigger breadth of soil health tests, including PLF PLFAs. Um, I'm not sure if American Ag Labs in McCook, Nebraska has it right now, but most of the tests, most of the labs that do offer Haney will also offer your traditional fertility tests. So we kind of 
from the university and RCS, we kind of recommend both that you use both the, the traditional fertility test. Um, those are very, very well studied. Our recommendations based off of those are very, very well known. We've been using those methods for decades. Um, meanwhile, the Haney tests were kind of newer, so we're kind of splitting down, split, split in the middle, right? We work for extension, you split in the middle for a lot of stuff. Um, this is gonna be recorded, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. <laughs> All right, so we have, yes, sorry, Chris. Yes, yes, they're absolutely, sorry. The question was, is there a seasonality aspect to the Haney test? Yes, so if you're gonna be doing the Haney tests, um, it's the same kind of idea with soil fertility. Test the same time every year. Typically, we recommend spring or fall whenever you're gonna be doing your soil fertility testing, um, which usually you wanna use in conjunction with your fertilizer application timing. So the Haney tests, most, pretty much any soil test is a snapshot of the soil condition, the soil nutrients at that moment in time. It's like taking a photo of what's in your soil um, and that will change throughout the season, right? So we know that soil microbe activity and nutrient cycling in general, is it's pretty low in the winter, right? We typically don't recommend you go take a soil sample in January because you're not going to see the full microbial activity. There's not going to be as much nutrient cycling. But also we know that it will see increased respirations in the peak of the summer, right? When our soil is most active, when we have fertilizer, when we have living roots in the ground, we're seeing a lot more and a lot different activity. But we can't plan our whole year off of our highest and lowest. So typically fall and spring, if you um, take it in the spring, take it in the spring again the next time you do it. Be, be consistent, right? A lot of farming is just being consistent and finding what works. If you realize that you're doing all of your fertilizer applications in the fall, take your soil samples in the fall and time it to that. Um, so the next test is one of our kind of new cutting edge science stuff. It is the PLFA test, so phospholipid fatty acids. So this test is also offered by Ward Labs, along with the Missouri State, um, they have a health, soil health testing center. Um, it's pretty cool, I got to go down there and see it a few years ago. It's a really, it's a really nice lab set up. Um, but PLFAs are essentially what's being left behind by microbes from their cell membranes. Now this is another one like the Haney test, different labs will use different key fatty acid indicators um, for them. So again, if you're going to be doing this test, pick a lab and stick with it. So PLFAs, we know are a great indicator of soil health. We know they're a great indicator of the fungus and the microbes and the bacteria and the protozoa that are living in our soil, but it's pretty, it's pretty on the edge. So we don't have all of our bacteria DNA sequenced. That would be insane. There are so many of them, but uh, we do, and we don't necessarily know exactly what fatty PLFA goes with each individual microbe species. So a lot of times that's why you kind of just see total bacteria, and then we can break that down into our gram positive and our gram negative bacteria. We can get our proportions from that. Um, we do know that our fungi will have different PLFAs from our bacteria, so we can kind of get an estimate of how much fungal activity we have in the soil. And then we can break it down to our protozoa, which we don't like quite as much, and then undifferentiated so we can't tell what exactly kind of critter that is and we kind of prove the point 37 percent of that sample is undifferentiated so this one is actually looking pretty good um, they gave the total biomass as excellent so above average and good so that's looking pretty good but there's still a lot of stuff that we don't know so we can test our soil we can say are there living things in our soil do we have a good mycorrhizal population can, or can we improve um, so PLFA grade tests are great for that. We can't figure out each individual species quite yet, um, but they're kind of a good indicator if you do have microbial activity or a lot of times if we're planting legumes, we need to inoculate the seed or inoculate the soil. So it's kind of an indicator of, do you have enough bacteria there already that you might not need to inoculate quite so much or you might have to inoculate. Yes. Thank you. 
Yeah, so Taylor's question was, um, do we have a Colorado database of what our bacterial loads pretty much are for this test? No. <laughs> um, we, a lot of those ratings are based off of the literature. So soil scientists and microbiologists who are developing, who developed the PLFA tests and used it, um, they have pretty much based those readings off of literature of what we consider from healthy soils to poorly managed soils. Um, we have some newer data out of the CSU uh, soil science departments that is discussing PLFAs and kind of how we can see the rise under different management practices, um, but we don't necessarily have an available database for that quite yet. That's a good idea. There you go. That's another job for you. <laughs> so we do like like the Haney test. We have a few examples in here. Um, so there is one. I think the worst the worst one was number three. Right. And even then, these were a lot of times the people who are getting these tests have already been doing soil management, good soil management practices for soil health. So a lot of them are coming out pretty, looking pretty good. Um, we see those numbers dip. And we kind of see our mycorrhizal population dip. Does everyone know what mycorrhizal is? I talk about it? Okay. You never know. <laughs> um, we see that a lot when we have fields um, under continuous monoculture, if we do corn and corn and corn and corn, and under really heavy tillage practices, right? So sort of those things that we say, like if you do too much of, you're gonna, you're gonna start impacting your soil health. Hey buddy, um, you're distracting. <laughs> I know, mycorrhiza populations. Just don't do it for the kids these days. Um, if you're doing really heavy tillage, if you're planting a continuous crop, you'll probably see those populations dip and go down. That's kind of when, if, you're, if you've ever listened to Ray Archuleta, that's when we see our soil become dirt. It's kind of not really living and doing great. That's a lot of times when we see these numbers be low. Um, a lot of times the people who are getting the PLFA tests are already doing a lot of good management practices. That's just antidotal, kind of from my experience, of people who are more interested in how they can further improve and you know, feed that little underground herd you got going on. Um, and the final test I've got in here, we'll try to wrap it up so we can get to the fun, more fun stuff, um, is the TDN test. So that's total digestible nutrients. So has anybody done a forage sample test? Got the results back. Yeah. So this is the same thing as a forage sample test. So I included this in here as an example. Um, I talked to Mr. Gunderson, who's the owner of Region Ags and Ag Labs, and he said this is becoming really popular. Um, I have honestly only just learned about it in the last few years. It's the same process as finding the total digestible nutrients in your forage. So the idea is what nutrients are actually available. This isn't just when we do the Haney test, we do a traditional soil test, we're doing an extraction method. So we're isolating just that one nutrient and pulling it out of our soil and measuring how much is there. And we know that we can isolate that available, the plant available compounds, and that's what we do, right? That tells us I have this many pounds of phosphorus that my plant can take up this year. So the TDN test, the idea is to be a more holistic picture of how much is actually there in all kind of forms. We're learning a lot about carbon cycling and nitrogen cycling and phosphorus cycling and that's why that's one of the reasons why farming is so cool it's always it's always kind of the cutting edge nothing ever stays the same for very long um but it's looking at i saw the puppy again and it just it got, it, no no the puppy's fine <laughs> the puppy's not the problem i'm the problem um it's supposed to be that total availability, so how we can manage the total picture of the soil rather than managing just N, P, and K in our one little, our one little bubble and have a full cycle. So, any questions on interpreting soil tests? Yes. Oh, uh, oh yeah. I mean, I got a lot of questions. It's <laughs> what I'm here for. How much is this test, do you think? Oh, I just looked at it. The PLFAs are sitting at 70. I cannot remember what the TDN tests are, um, how much they cost. I just had that website open too. Um, and I, and I, have, I have some random questions on soil health that I would, use to, 
I, I'm like getting people's opinion because my friend told me this and I want to know. So I'm getting votes from different people. So do you think, will gypsum change your pH? Because it says pH neutral, but he argued with me for a while. He's like, don't do it. You think, because my pH is like 7.8. So, and I put some on, but I was trying to also like push the calcium because there's a really high salt uh, amount on my, uh, in my field. So I'm trying to like make sure I don't get there. But what do you think about pH and gypsum? If you add yeah. excessive amounts, yeah. it will raise your pH. Okay. But since your pH is sitting at 7.8, if you were at like 8.5, I get worried, but it, it's a calcium, right? Yeah. It will raise your pH over time. If you're doing it to address the soil, I'm assuming you got a soil test. Okay. I'm assuming you're applying gypsum at the rate that was recommended. I actually applied less. Then I would say you're fine. Okay, I, because I was just, I mean, uh, okay. So you think it does raise the pH, then it might. Over time, if you apply excessive over time, it will. Interesting. Okay. All right. I, I, it says pH neutral on the bag, which is what really is confusing. And it's like, it says it doesn't raise the pH. And then I've talked to other people and they're like, eh, it won't raise the pH. But he's like, one of my friends from Pennsylvania had a real bad experience. He put gypsum on and he said it blew his pH up. And yeah, I don't know. If Pennsylvania soils will interact with gypsum differently yeah. than Colorado soil as well. Okay. So gypsum, in Pennsylvania, I went to Penn State. I got a great lecture from one of our professors one day um, that people will have crusty compacted soils and we don't know how they did it, but they'll go out and they'll apply a lot of lime or gypsum thinking it will improve the soil structures and it will spike your pH um, in Pennsylvania. If you're applying it at the rates that were recommended or lower here to address a salt issue, I wouldn't be concerned if you are applying it in excess if you go back in three years and soil test again and see your soil ph rising then i would pull back on the gypsum and suggest doing some veg vegetative remediation for that soil if you can just plant some switch grass and then mow it out and plant some switch grass okay. that might work okay. but the gypsum should be fine yeah so. i actually have to get my pond tested but i have put pond water on and it could be anything but there is like little residue staying over just from that water so i'm probably going to get it tested i'm also flushing it i have to flush it first and i'm still waiting to cold water but uh yeah that's why i'm also kind of nervous yeah i would i would recommend getting your water tested um if you know that you have a high salt concentration in your soil already i would recommend getting a water test um it's useful just because sometimes if we have extremes in irrigation water or livestock water even if we're pulling if you're on the eastern side of the state and you're pulling from aquifers sometimes we see nitrates get too high and we can get to the point where if we're feeding a high nitrate feed and high nitrate water we can start seeing nitrate poisoning on cattle um, so it's sometimes we, we almost don't think about it we think about our soil tests a lot we think about our forage tests to feed animals and our compost tests and this and that sometimes we forget there's a lot we have to put a lot of water on out here so you need to kind of balance it with your water impact also. Yes, that's actually an ongoing thing where myself and a few other NRCS folks are trying to figure out. Um, you can use water softeners if it's too high in um, heavy compounds if it's too high in calcium there's not really any great ways to address salt in water um, a lot of times if somebody comes to me and says like oh I've got really high calcium and salt in my in, from my well water I'm going to assume that it's an older well um, and you've just you're you're pulling it too much and it's time to retire the well and drop another one um, if it's, that's not the case, if it's a newer well, it's, it's pretty high, it's probably hitting on top of one of the limestone beds. Um, and in which case, plant crops that are more salt tolerant. That's, that's the best thing I can tell you right now. Um, that's an ongoing larger discussion a number of us are having to try to figure out the best way to 
adjust that with salt sensitive crops. Yeah, yes, sure. So I guess my first question is, what is your, what is your long-term management goal for your soil? Increased carbon content. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> You're a terrible, terrible assistant. Um, can I ask, why is that your primary goal? Okay, so I'll just go on to the second question. Sure, sure, sure. So I'm sure you've heard of like uh, the Australian carbon credit units and how Australia is paying regenerative farmers to sequester carbon and mitigate climate change. I'm hoping that something like that happens with the U.S. eventually. Um, and so I kind of want that data to prove what we're doing to where if that ever becomes a thing, we can be like, hey, we've been doing this for 20 years and look at all the work we've done. Yes. First, I want to say super kudos to you because on the discussions with the carbon credits, there's been this whole issue of like, well, we don't have, what did they have before? And how do we credit people? So 100% kudos to you that you're like already ahead of the game on that. Um, two, so that kind of goes into a sideways um, discussion. When we're talking about carbon sequestration, we can't have carbon sequestration without having a well holistically managed soil. So some of the discussions around what, there's a lot of really great soil health data coming out of Australia. Um, are con some of the concerns for how their management strategies are approaching the nitrogen and dry land. Some, some, can me, I am concerned that we might get to the point where we start um, mining our soils with nitrogen. So we can pull so much nitrogen out of our soil. Um, I kind of think of it this way. There's a pool of nutrients in your soil, right? If we plant something on there, those nutrients, those plants are going to pull a certain amount of nutrients every year why we fertilize is because we can get to the point where we pull those nutrients so far out that those soils can't function they can't have that nutrient cycling we don't see that conversion of organic n to inorganic n we see no active carbon we only see the labile carbon we only see that really solid pool we don't have carbon actively moving through that cycle so a lot of times we're focusing so much on putting just carbon into our soil we can kind of lose some of that other picture and kind of monkey around with our levels. So a lot of what the, especially if you're managing pastures, just by their nature, they are going to put carbon into the soil. Every time they build their root structure, they will be taking CO2 from the atmosphere, releasing O2. They'll be doing the photosynthetic cycle and they will be putting sugars and, um, forgetting the word. Basically, they'll be putting food into their roots. The roots will slough off and you'll be adding carbon to your soils. So if you're looking for just your baseline information, what the amount of organic matter is, and a lot of our organic matter is um, primarily organic carbon. And if you're looking for just your total carbon content, probably the most effective way to look at it over time, the most cost effective way might be the Haney test, just for the purpose of it will give you the most comprehensive picture. Um, the TDN is on the edge of science. I don't, you know, I can't really give great recommendations around the TDN just because I'm still becoming familiar with it myself. Um, and I usually try to be very, very honest about what I know and what I don't know. Um, it's, it's growing. It might be one of those ones that you try if you do the Haney test this year, maybe in three years, you do the Haney test and the TDN to compare them for where you're at. I think if you're looking for, for, the, for the full picture of your soil health at this moment, the Haney test is the most well-established. Um, that being said, I, if you're doing a diversified grazing system, I'm assume, assuming you're doing managed intensive grazing and rotational, you should pretty much see those soil health indicators just go off. They love, like, putting animals on the land and doing intensive grazing, it, it works so fantastically well, right? Even on croplands, we see um, corn fields that we're grazing the residue from the corn, if we're grazing the corn stover with cattle 
and adding compost and manure, we see those fields increase in organic matter significantly faster than fields that don't have animals on them. Um, so even just having the animals there and turning those plants over, if you're doing good grazing management, the root structure and the root system of those pasture plants should increase. They'll be sequestering carbon. Those animals will be returning carbon to the soil. Um, you should see those factors go up pretty quickly. So you should see, as a byproduct of your good management, you're going to see that increased rate of carbon. Does that make sense? That was a very long answer. No, <laughs> yeah. definitely. One, one more uh, clarification. Sure. Is there a conversion for the parts per, per million carbon, organic carbon content on the Haney test to a percent carbon? I would assume so. But the, the TDN was the only one I saw percent carbon on. You know what? I'm not sure. Huh? Everyone can't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> I would assume. I would assume so, because it's part per million, so there should be a way to find that percentage. I don't know if it will give you a percentage of the total soil. It's it's a good assumption that the majority of your organic matter percentage will be organic carbon. The NRCS has fantastic, this guy. Um, pretty much everything that I'll do is either less intense versions of that. Um, but if you, if you are interested in NRCS programs, you can have an NRCS agent come out and write a conservation plan for you. NRCS is focusing on um, planning first rather than just signing up for programs. So getting out and figuring out what's the issues and how we can actually help you move towards conservation as a whole system rather than just getting you signed up to put in some pipes or what on. Uh, so, but we do have agents that can help you walk through this process on your farm if you'd like. So this document is kind of geared towards row crop farmers. Um, so does, yes, the front page of this, yeah. uh, that big guy. Yeah, so just about all these you can do at home with fairly simple equipment. Um, so, I've got jars of water. Uh, <laughs> um, no, it is. which is perfect. So what we're gonna do is actually two different soil um, water stable aggregate tests. So you can order this from a lab. It's usually a little bit more expensive and they do it much more intensely in the lab. They're not using just jars of water. Um, but essentially what we wanna see when we're increasing our soil health and our soil, or and our soil organic matter is we see increased aggregate stability. So the aggregates are those nice clumps of soil. So if you're going out and digged up a really fibrous plant and you pull it out, those roots are just covered in dreadlocks. Um, like those, you call them the soil dreadlocks. Yeah, so that is your soil aggregates. We like soil aggregates. Soil aggregates don't fall apart. They increase uh, pore space. They give microenvironments for our microbes to live in. Um, they'll be helped stuck together by our mycorrhizal fungi. Generally, we see soil water holding capacity increase with aggregate stability, right? Also, it helps that your soil doesn't leave. We like our soil to stay <laughs> on the farm. Please stop letting your soil blow away. Um, I have taught so many people the phrase <laughs> unnecessary tillage that leads to wind erosion. So if you're driving out in the plains and you see that beautiful cloud of soil leaving, there goes your nutrients. Um, yeah, people really don't like driving through the plains with me. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, so these are just, we call this a slump test. It is a demo version of the slake test. So the slake test, if it's done by a soil scientist from the NRCS, will come out and help you measure your soil, ag your aggregate stability using very nice little dipping methods. It was, it's kind of an art to get this done right, and it's kind of hard to see. Um, so we're going to do just a bigger version of it. So these are just some old jars and some very nice mason jars that I borrowed today. Um, and these are just sink strainers that I picked up at King Sleepers the other day. So they're relatively inexpensive. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna drop these guys in here. So you guys can get close up on in this. 
So these are some clay <laughs> samples that were taken from this farm. And we're just going to leave them in there for a little bit. Right? So you see, they're, they're holding together pretty well, right? So think about a rainstorm. Think about our really heavy, sudden rainstorms in Colorado, right? We just submerge those completely, and they're holding together. They're acting like sponges. That's cool. That's great, right? So I have no idea if this guy's going to work. This is some really gnarly clay <laughs> I pulled out of my front yard this morning. Um, so this test does work better when the soil is completely dry. We've had a very wet spring. It's been a bit of a struggle to get things to dry out completely. I am not anticipating that those are going to, yeah. See how it just clouds and falls apart? It's less than ideal. That's water running down your creek. That's water running to the ditch. That's water running to your neighbor's property, right? So what we can also do, we're going to leave those there for a second. And what I'm going to do is, I kind of call this like the quick, the quick water event. And what I'm also going to do, and this is just chicken wire stuck over glass jars, um, is I'm going to put a few clumps, go in there, buddy, a few clumps in here, and we're going to leave these guys here until the end, and we're going to come back and look at them again. We'll do the same thing for our farm sample, which I'm pretty sure was under some cover crops. Oh, I'm not sure which one you grabbed. That's field um, three. Yeah, field three? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. This chicken wire was not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> this was left over from a previous demo, and this is what I pulled out of my garage. So ideally, you'd be using like a hardware cloth or a smaller gauge. The idea is just to have it be held in the water up, but there's a, they're doing okay. <laughs> so <laughs> we I try. So we're about to show you. So put this guy back in here. Use my handy dandy sherbet lid. Um, <laughs> this is what I love about extension. Everything can be used for a demo. <laughs> Recycling, it's great, right? So these two we're going to leave. Um, kind of think of these as the long term, lots of rain, really wet year. We're just going to leave them there as our long term. Now what we're going to do is take these bad boys, think of this as your, your quick rain event, as called the slump test, because we're going to take them, dip them, kind of get the rest out and then flip that guy. And it's a clay, so it's actually holding together pretty well, right? But at the same time, it fell apart pretty quickly, and if I bust this guy open, he's only a little bit wet inside. It's like a clay ball. Clay does not absorb super, super well, right? Get the dirt off my hands. <laughs> so ideally, what we want to see, I'll kind of look at show you guys, this turned to a lot of mud. Right? There's a lot of slick mud in there. That's not super great. What we want to see is the whole thing kind of hold together. So it did stay in some clumps, but it's a clay. I wasn't expecting it to be fabulous. It's just so much of a clay. It's just straight clay. Mm -hmm. was um, that from your yard? This is from my yard, which is under a pine tree and has been abused <laughs> <laughs> by previous renters. It wasn't me. Um, very, it's just, it's like you stick a shovel into it and you get that far down and that's it. It's not great. So we'll take our nice field soil and we'll do the same thing, right? And what we want to see is not a huge amount sitting at the bottom, right? And it's a little bit tricky to see with these jars, but we do have a little bit more of those larger sediments, kind of that sand sitting from my beautiful front yard than we do from our nice field soil. And our nice field soil, even if I kind of, it's sticking together, right? I have to actively push this apart. And that's part function, because it's another clay soil, but part function that it has more stable water aggregates. So these would be considered large water stable aggregates. When we get down to about the size of a racer tip, that's when you get to small water stable aggregates. So we want to have a mix of both. Right? We want to have porous space um, within our soil because we, can't, we don't want to have just a block of soil. Right? Think about trying to live on a brick. If you're a microbe, do you really want to live on a brick? There's not really a lot of oxygen in there. <laughs> um, we want to have that good porous space. We want to have the aggregates that create channels that water can flow through. But we want our aggregates to still stick together like a sponge. Mm -hmm. Make sense? And what are some management practices to improve that if you're seeing like you know, really slick money, like how do we get those aggregates to form? 
So clay soils are a challenge to manage. Um, I saw one farmer who said, if you stick with them when they're dry, they'll stick to you when it's wet, <laughs> right? <laughs> they will. Um, a lot of times it's gonna be your reduced, you kind of almost have to be delicate with them. Reduced tillage is a great first step. Um, cover crops is a great first step. Um, soil texture cannot be changed. Those basic components of your sand, silt, and clay, those are founded from thousands, thousands of years ago. You can't change that. You cannot change your soil texture, but what you can change is your soil quality, right? So if you reduce your tillage, um, utilize cover crops, introduce extra organic matter, like compost manure, grazing animals, um, don't go too heavy, don't run heavy equipment on it. If you know you have a heavy clay soil, stay out of it when it's wet. If it's, unless it's like you have to move equipment through them that day, just don't do it. Just don't, just, I don't care if you want to harvest your corn today. You're not harvesting your corn today. Um, it's just not going to happen. Do not, sorry. I have very strong opinions about running up clay fields. Yes. What about um, grazing, doing rotational grazing, bringing your equipment in to move them? Is it better to overgraze or to just wait off for a week and overgraze that one section and not mess up your soil? So we have seen, um, there was a study out of CSU on a irrigated pivot with management intensive grazing. We know that we, if we don't have significant compaction from hoofs, that that compaction will kind of work itself out within a year as long as it's kind of in the top five inches or so. The problem is when we get clay soils, really heavy rain, they will destroy the plants when they're going through and really chewing up that soil. So typically with that, we recommend that you have a sacrifice lot. If you know that heavy rain is coming, um, pull the animals off, put them in a sacrifice lot, feed them there, wait until the fields dry out. Because if you get, a lot of times my thought is if you get them chewed up too much, sometimes that vegetation can't recover. And a lot of times that vegetation is expensive to get going, expensive to get it started in a good stand. And you don't want to kill your pasture. Um, the compaction there is a little bit less of my concern. My concern more is you're going to have to renovate a whole section of your pasture. Yeah. Okay. Sacrifice lots will, you sacrifice them, they look terrible, but <laughs> they do you a lot of favors. We've got elk over here that are what, 1,200 pounds minimum. So probably a couple of sheep aren't really gonna get break that five inch plate. There's more of the truck though. Right, right. Like yeah. Truck lines in trying to move our trailers and stuff. If you're going to be moving heavy equipment across it, if you absolutely have to to get animals out, um, pick the edge of the field. Don't go driving straight through the center. Pick the edge, keep it to one area. So that's just your one area. So we know repeatedly driving in wet soils for a full season, we'll start to see that compaction go deeper and deeper and deeper, especially with the increased weight of equipment. So if it goes from a pickup truck to a tractor, the tractor will cause more compaction on wet soils. Um, the, the best advice is to try to just minimize it to one area so that way that's, you're not impacting the whole field. It's better to just mess up that edge than it is to be rutting up your entire field. Um, a little bit less worried with sheep unless you have a really, a really heavy flock. Cattle, horses, I'd pull them off. We do, see, we do see the elk sometimes messing things up. But animals will naturally kind of shelter during the rain. Hi, baby. That's sunny. Sunny is a great field assistant. She is. She likes to follow the ducks around and eat poop. Sunny, are you going to be a herding dog? Okay. So, we're, there's now audio recording of me cooing at a puppy. I just realized that. So, uh. My parents try so hard to raise a professional. Um, so what we're going to do first is a water infiltration test. So I love water infiltration tests out here because we use a lot of water, right? We irrigate a lot. We want to make sure that we're using the water when we have it available and how much water our soils will actually take in when it rains. So we don't get rid of a huge amount. This year is making a little bit of a liar out of me at that, but <laughs> typically we don't see a lot of rains. When we see rain, we want to make sure we're taking as much advantage of it as 
we can. So this is a six inch diameter ring. Um, the six inches does matter because the amount of water we add will be based off of a inch of water, right? So your vol if you have a bigger ring, you'll need a greater volume, smaller volume, so on and so forth. So this is a six inch ring. You can use um, irrigation pipe. It's usually about six inches. The edges of the bottom of this ring are beveled, so it's easier to get in. And I was actually lucky. This is soft enough. I could just push it in. Most of the time, it requires a piece of wood and a mallet. You just put it over, hammer it in. It's the same idea when you're taking a bulk density test. You just hammer it in, um, keep it pretty stable. I did push the soil a little bit against the edges just to kind of reduce leakage out just because it is a pretty light soil. And this is 400 and 44 milliliters of water. So over our six inch area, this will be an inch of water. So I've got saran wrap down. So what we'll do is pour water on top of our saran wrap. Pull it, I'll get Taylor to be my assistant. You can use a stopwatch for this. Um, I usually just use a phone because it's handy. So, and this is something you can, you can do at home in your own fields, your garden your mother's community garden, if she keeps calling and asking you about it. Um, but we typically want to do this test when the field's a little bit drier or a little bit lower than field uh, water holding capacity. So our fields all have a, the field water holding capacity. That's the amount of water a field can hold before it starts ponding and infiltration stops because there's too much water there, right? So at some point, no matter how good your soil health is, if you exceed your water, your field holding capacity, you're going to have standing water and ponding in your fields. Ideally, we don't want to see that. You can't grow plants there and kind of get stagnant. Um, so you typically want to have this under normal field conditions, so a little bit lower or a little bit drier than what your water holding capacity will normally be. Nope, not yet. Okay. I'll tell you when. So you pour it in and that will be an inch of water. And this is not for puppies. <laughs> so the saran wrap is just holding it in. So as soon as I pull this, you are going to start your timer. And let us do technical methods. Then you just watch it. <laughs> because this way it's um, hitting the whole surface at the same time. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's evenly spread out. So the idea is we're measuring how many inches of water we'll be able to move and infiltrate into our soil per minute. So if we have a one inch rainstorm in 10 minutes, is your field going to be able to absorb that fast enough? It's got some of it. No. It is a little bit, it is a little bit wet already, um, so it might be a little bit slower than if it was drier, just because there's already water filling up those spaces, right? So there's a lot of air spaces, a lot of oxygen within our soil already, and if it can't, there's no room for that water to move in, it will just stay on the top and pond. So it's starting to get there. Usually you, you want to stop the timer when it's about, the soil is just glistening, right? So you know when you see that like right after a rainstorm and everything's a little damp, so it's a little bit glistening. Um, it's not moving tremendously quickly, <laughs> which is no comment on your no, advantage. No, I mean, yeah, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Clay soils, it's probably pretty I mean, slow usually around here. Clay soils is usually really slow. Um, so clay, if you think about like a clay putty, think about a clay putty versus like a nice loamy organic prairie soil, mm -hmm. right? Clay is a very small particle. Small particles like to be close together. And if they're really close together, there's not, oh, you can stop the timer. There's not as much uh, space between yeah. those soil particles versus if you have, think about a sand on a beach. They're both pretty big. So if they're both pretty big, they're touching more like that. There's a lot of space in there for water to move through. So that's our struggle with clay soils is how can we increase those aggregates? Cause it wants to clump together. It wants to be a pot, right? Mm -hmm. 
but we want it to break up a little bit and be, have more organic matter in there. So it's creating more pore space so we can have more things move through our soil. All right, what was our time? One minute, 58 seconds. So it takes just about two minutes for an inch of soil to infiltrate, which isn't great, right? Two minutes for one inch of water. <laughs> so if we have, say, an inch of water come down over an hour, no, we, let's hope not. <laughs> we might see this field might be uh, start seeing some water erosion and some rills occur. So if you remember a lot of those um, really, really big rainstorms in the Midwest last year, there are fields out there that are capable of taking in an inch per minute, but it exceeded the rate that the soil could take in that water. So if we dump water on really quickly, even if we have good management, sometimes we can see water erosion occur, um, but with those low steady rains. So ideally we would like to get that time down over time. Um, that's not something that can happen within one season, but it's kind of a good idea, especially if you're planning on using irrigation on how you can time your irrigation so you know all that water is actually making its way into the soil and into the plants versus just standing on the surface of the of the soil because then you kind of have ponding you're going to lose soil well, lose the water to evaporation you're not being very effective we do live in the west we do like to encourage people to think about their water efficiency and how well they're actually using their water not putting on excess mm -hmm. questions what would be like an ideal time then minute or, minute or less minute. Um, I, I did know a Pennsylvania farmer who sweared to me that he could get like five inches in an hour. I did not see it for myself, but he was also a really hardcore no-till cover crop guy who'd been doing that for 20 years. So that's also something we sometimes forget to talk about. A lot of our really great soil health pioneers are, um, why am I blanking his name? He works with Ray Archuleta a lot. Yes, Brown. Gabe Brown, amazing to see his operation, amazing to hear him speak. You have to remember Gabe Brown's been doing this for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? A lot of these soil health practices are slow moving. They're not gonna happen instantly. That's not a silver bullet. I li wish we had a silver bullet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Similar amount of rain to here though. Yeah, so you can do it. It is possible, it is 100% possible. I 100% encourage you to like get after it, live your best life live your best soil health dreams, <laughs> um, but it won't. Thank you so much. <laughs> it will be a slow process. All right, cool. We've got 10 minutes and I'll show you. I'm sorry, I talk a lot. No, it's easy to talk about this all day. Did you say 440 milliliters or grams? 440 milliliters, milliliters. Yeah, so this guy is about um, this little guy is got up to a measurement of 300. Mm -hmm. I used a, a measuring cup at home um, to measure up to 440. You can use, if you want to be really precise, you can use a graduated cylinder. I did not happen to have one of those in my lunch. <laughs> I like the mason jar science. <laughs> it's a lot easier. <laughs> cool. All right. So if we're talking about water infiltration and water retention in the, whoa, there was a rock. <laughs> Dry rest. Um, I will throw in the comments to learn how to measure your residue. So that is in that NRCS packet. NRCS recommends at least 30% ground cover um, for just for conservation practice in general. Please ignore my strings. I was doing a different project with this. Um, really scientific. But uh, this is a half meter squared. So I like to use hula hoops or quadrants because I can throw them. Um, you can also use point transects, so take a 100 meter tape every 10 meters, count how many times a piece of residue is touching your tape, um, and you can get a calculation of your percentage from there. Just having cover on the soil will do wonders for your water holding, right? If it gets really hot, really dry, really quickly, the soil that has cover on it will retain water, there'll be less evaporation, and it will stay cooler longer. So we know when soil reaches above, like around 100, 100 degrees or so, mm -hmm. we start killing microbes, we start killing fungi. So this is a part of the reason why we like to see no-till. Yeah. When you talk about at least 30% ground cover, is that looking at the canopy or like each individual stem? Mm -hmm. Like what, how are you visualizing? So, 
Uh, when you're talking about crown cover, are you visualizing the canopy or each individual stem? So, yes. <laughs> This guy, I, I like squares because it's easier for me to visualize them. Um, how you normally do it is you just pick a random spot. I really love to take a number of random steps and throw it method. And then if you are looking at your post harvest ground cover, so you've already gone out. I'm sorry, I kind of default automatically to um, row crops, side effect of being an agronomist. <laughs> I talk about agronomy. So if I was doing this after post harvest and I was talking to a corn farmer, I would say, look at how much corn residue is on your ground. Look at how many leaves and how many stalks, how much stover you have, right? If I'm only seeing half of this as uh, covered in stover and half bare ground, then I'd be worried. When things are out here green and growing and maybe you've got a cover crop growing, we'll pretend this hemp is cover crop. I would go by the canopy cover. <laughs> it's a cover crop now. <laughs> um, I would say we're a little bit short of 30%. So it can do, we know we can do, we can get a lot of uh, evaporation reduction just from the shading and canopy closure, right? If you want to talk about canopy closure, you go into a whole world of light temperature weed suppression, but canopy closure is typically pretty good. Um, it's a little bit different with vegetables because you have to have that row spacing so you can get people between them. But even like the black plastic will help retain moisture under there. Cool. All right. So let's pull this oil sample. <laughs> so I got two tools. Um, I, if you're going to be, if you have a large number of fields, you have to test. I would recommend investing in a soil probe. Um, this is just the hand, you push this guy in method. Um, I'm, a, I'm lazy, I like the ones you can jump on like pogo sticks. Yeah. <laughs> Those are my favorites. Um, I usually wear like really good like stomping boots that day. I don't, don't try to do this if you've got clay soils that are really, really dried out you're not gonna have good results. Your soil test results are only as good as your soil sample collection. Um, it can get a little tricky with our sandy soils just because they tend to fall apart within there, but they're pretty, they're handy if you've got a lot of soil samples you have to take. It will make it a lot easier, a lot faster, and you will be removing less soil from your field. Plus you get lots of fun little holes all through your field <laughs> um, that confuse your students. So, whoo, that was on a stone. If you just have a shovel though, you can still do it. There's no problem. So ideally we want to take a sample from uh, zero to six inches. And fortunately this, this is kind of a good example for taking an example sample, because uh, we don't have a lot of plant matter on the surface. So we don't want to include our plant matter in our soil sample. We're looking at just the soil. picking a spot in your field then there where there's nothing growing or do you just pull the, pull the grass up. out? So depending on what what extension service you look at for your recommendation they might tell you to just cut the top inch off um, especially if you're in a pasture like a really dense cool season pasture then you might just need to take a putty knife and chop the full the full top inch if there's a lot of root matter in there. Yeah. We don't have an O-layer so much in Colorado. Um, so the O layer is usually that top organic humus yeah. on soil. Yeah, we don't really have that. yeah. So we don't really have to cut that off. <laughs> so it's kind of very sassy. Uh, sassiest workshop I've ever taught. Um, stick the shovel in the ground. That's your first step. So you kind of have two options. If you have a pretty dense soil that you can take just a slice out of, you can take one and then back it up. I'm not going to do that here because it's pretty, it's been worked. I don't, it's going to crumble. If you've got a dense soil, you can take as a slice. You can just put one shovel in, back it up a few inches, go directly behind it, parallel, take a slice down and then pull that slice up, um, cut it, 
the sides. It'll be the same method. Or, this guy worked in. You can, please work. You got some sand down there. There's some stuff. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh yeah, you got sand in there. Um, Yeah. Right? Yeah. For the glacial lake or something? We have a lot of um, like undersea beaches throughout the West. Yeah. So your goal here is to kind of take a soil core like you would be taking with your probe. It'll just be bigger, right? So I didn't do a super great job on this guy, but for sake of time, we'll hurry along. Um, butter knife, putty knife, pocket knife, whatever you've got. You're gonna kind of just cut off the sides. <laughs> I'm so cool. Multichrome knife. Um, kind of chop off the sides. So what you're really aiming to do is every sample you take, take a full sample straight down from your full top six inches, right? And then you're gonna to wanna to get kind of an equal amount of soil from each sample you take because you're gonna be compositing your samples from across the entire field. That was aggressive. Um, and you don't want one sample to overwhelm the rest of the samples. So you wanna take your samples randomly in a zigzag pattern across your field, and you can exclude any significant outlying areas. So if you have an area that you know was historically where the water trough was, where a pile of hay was, an extremely low spot, um, exclude those from your field sampling we typically want to sample our field, uh, manage our fields as a whole entity, unless you want to get into precision ag. It's a whole different field. Um, it's good fun. It's a whole different field. Um, <laughs> it's Sunday. Um, so you want, to, you want to get a representative sample of your entire field, right? So if you've got a place that you knew the feeder was two years ago, that has been there historically for 20 years, don't sample that area. It might skew your results. Okay, so clean up your edges, kind of chop your top bits off, right? I will, if I'm doing a lot of sampling um, on my probe, I will usually mark with a piece of masking tape, the bottom of the masking tape being the depth that I want. I'll stick my probe into that depth and then I'll pull it out. Uh, you can do the same on a shovel. They do tend to wear off if you're doing a lot of sampling and you will typically have to replace them part way through. Or, come on, bud. Uh, you can just measure. So then, clean this up a little bit more. So you kind of got your nice little, nice little core. It's a little bit bigger than you would with a probe, but I've got in there my full top layer down to my bottom layer, right? So if I'm consistently sticking it sideways and only getting the top three inches, I'm missing three inches. Um, from there, I would usually, if I'm using a shovel, I double check myself if I don't have a tape marking and make sure I'm actually only doing six inches. Again, the goal is to be consistent. Make sure you're consistently co collecting the same amount everywhere. So I actually got eight inches. So I say goodbye, friend. Right? And that's what I would put in my bucket. Um, you will put all of your samples from the same depth in one bucket together. Um, bring a bucket out with you. If you're gonna be sampling for two depths, label them clearly. You can go so far as to color code them. There is no pain, like realizing you just dropped a zero to six sample in the six to 12 inch bucket, because then you have to do all of them over again. But this will go in my bucket. I'll mix this with all my other samples. I will take about a cup to two cups and let them air dry. Don't put them in a plastic bag, leave them out on cardboard, let it air dry. Don't put them in the oven and then put it in my collection bag. Don't oven bake them. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised someone has done that before. It will, it will skew, it will uh, destroy some of the compounds and it will skew your results. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm super curious because, um, so I'm just wondering if air drying like per for PFLA, PLFA, and uh, and TDN, like same same. I would double check. So every lab will have um, 
every lab will have a slightly different protocol. Every lab will want you to fill out their form a little bit differently. Um, so this is pretty much the 100% standard way to take it for any generic soil fertility test, regardless of lab you go to. For PLFLA, TDN, not so much Haney. Yeah. They might have specific collection methods listed on, they're typically on their website, yeah. um, because they'll want the samples to be preserved in a specific way, basically. Sometimes, depending on what soil test we're doing, we either need it dry, we need to keep it cold, so on and so forth. Um, okay. So just double check. If you have questions, you can contact the labs. Okay. And I was just curious because like microbes, I'm like, am I killing all my, mm. my microbes if I'm drying it out, you know? like. So if you're doing just a straight soil fertility test, yeah. you it should be matter. fine. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, I would double check. Okay. I haven't collected a Haiti test in a while. Okay. No, I have the instructions. <laughs> yeah, I would double check. I haven't had to collect one, but. So you said put it out on cardboard um, for how, how long? Until it's just dry. Okay. Until you can't really feel any moisture. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Once, once you have those cores set, like it doesn't matter if the depths get mixed at that point. Not, not the like in zero the to six. Yeah. So like zero to six everywhere you in your field, it. you want that kind of mixed up as you're drying it and sending it in for sample. Yeah, so what I would do is I would, if I was doing just zero to six, I would take every sample I take from each management area. So if you've got, if you manage this field separately from that field, take these as two separate soil tests, right? Um, I would take all my samples here, put them in a bucket, mix them all together, dump that out, and then let that air dry. And then from there, I'd probably mix it again just to be super sure, um, and send that into my sample. So, yes, yeah, yes. So a lot of times we'll have clods in our soil, especially when you're mixing and dumping them in. If you've got big rocks, you just return them to the field. Um, we're not, we don't really want to test our rocks. <laughs> we just hand them nicely to the field owner. Um, <laughs> So we'll also, especially with our clay soils, um, break up those big crumbles, our poor aggregates. But if we're going to be air drying them, break them, break up the crumbles before you send them in to the lab. Um, clay balls are really hard to break apart. The dogs are out. Of <laughs> <laughs> the dogs are done. Yeah. So you can just break them up when you put them into your bucket. Break them up when you put them out to dry. It's also a lot easier to get the sample completely mixed together if you're not trying to mix two marble sized clumps of clay together. Yeah. So. How many tests would you take from one acre? Uh, 15, to 15 to 20. So, oh, sorry. How many samples would you take from one acre? 15 to 20. Okay, put those together in a bucket, dry that out, and then take one or two cups of that. Yeah. Okay. So CSU does have soil sample bags, um, which I did not grab because <laughs> did that go on the list for the week? Um, and they will have a line on them that will say like fill line and you typically need to get that at least two thirds to three quarters of the way full um, for different tests they might have different requirements for the amount that they need for soil fertility you can typically just send a cup to two cups will be enough yeah. goodness um do you have any like i'm just super curious how like looking at the soil that you've been around for you know 10 minutes <laughs> Tell me, thus, I'm curious what your impressions are of this soil. Got a lot of rocks. <laughs> um, it looks like a typical, typical front range soil, mm -hmm. um, which has its, it's, it's not the worst I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, it's, <laughs> it's supposed to be nice. Um, you've definitely got a high clay. It's, it's a really typical Colorado soil. Um, do you care if I make another hole? No. I should probably move my knife out of there. It's definitely been worked. Um, so vegetable crops do typically require more soil working than like row crops will. You got, Jesus. Yeah, what's in there? I want to know. <laughs> I, oh, there you go. Now you've got your texture change, which is kind of 
also pretty common in Colorado. So the good news is you've got a nice layer on top that you can work some organic matter in, some compost into. Um, since you're going to be doing a lot of more hand stuff with veggies, mm -hmm. wow, you can toss the rocks out. Soil forms rocks. Okay. That's where rocks wow. come from. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people have asked me, why do I get rocks in my field? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think but they grow there, it's like gravel. Right? Yeah. yeah, it the shifts to this high. Oh, <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, 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 It's fuzzy. It's fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I'm fine being overshadowed by the puppy. I would be, I'm, yeah, no, I got it. Uh, you do about, you have about right around eight, ten inches down. It shifts to a sandy soil, mm -hmm. which my concern here would be uh, your water holding. Okay. So we typically want to encourage crops to grow deep roots mm -hmm. and pull water from as farther, farthest down as we can, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have to water as much. And there's a lot of great nutrients locked down, mm -hmm. like foot into the soil. The phosphorus can be down there for a while, so can carbon. Um, my concern would just be that you're gonna have issues with water infiltration, where if you work the soil too much, you could form a compaction layer mm -hmm. from that clay. Clay will compact pretty easy. Um, if you're doing extremely heavy tillage down to a foot, You'd, you'd be at pretty high risk for creating a plow layer, basically, and creating a hard pan, and hard mm -hmm. pans are less than ideal mm -hmm. to try to rip out. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of machinery and a lot of patience mm -hmm. to rip them out. My concern would just be that you're going to have trouble increasing your water infiltration into the top few inches, mm -hmm. especially if you have that sand where your water holding might be a little less. Right. right. So choosing drought tolerant varieties, um, varieties that maybe won't, if we get an extreme drought again, won't dry up as quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and then just encourage, encourage deep rooting. So I would, no-till is a lot harder with vegetables just because you have to create those beds. Mm -hmm. um, I would encourage cover cropping and manure and compost use and not working it super, super deep into the soil, kind of increase that infiltration water holding capacity on the top mm -hmm. couple of layers so it's not quite so likely to blow away. Mm -hmm. um, do you want the soil? I guess what problems could we expect given, given what you just found out? <laughs> I would um, suggest drip irrigation mm -hmm. first, so that you, I'm assuming. Yeah, we're, going we're doing the yeah. drip. I'm assuming you're doing drip irrigation, that will, uh, work with the slower infiltration rate. You'll be getting more of your water that way. Mm -hmm. um, we w Sometimes we want to conserve water, making sure we do have a irrigation guide for Colorado and including vegetable growers that does give your recommendations about the typical amount of water you'll mm -hmm. need per vegetable mm -hmm. plant. Um, Is that on the extension website? It's on the extension website. I can send you the link. Um, what about the manure compost with our already high existing Just high phosphorus? phosphorus? Mm. See, that makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we also have a hardwood humus compost mm -hmm. available that's local that's supposed to be less phosphorus, like less iron phosphorus, but I'm not that expert. So <laughs> typically a manure compost will be higher in phosphorus. Yes. Um, it's gonna be, animals, animals tend to excrete, we tend to overfeed phosphorus in animals. Um, to make sure we're meeting that need and then they excrete a lot of phosphorus back into the manure. I would, if you can find a more of a, like a food waste compost, like, like a, food waste compost mm -hmm. a backyard compost, a hardwood compost, make our own. That we'll might, it, yeah. mm -hmm. that would, it would have a lower phosphorus level. Um, I, would, I would encourage you to kind of stay away from the manure compost. Yeah. If you can do more of just Mm -hmm. The plant byproduct compost. Yeah, yeah. That would probably be a better bet. And is then there, my. Sorry, is there a certain kind of animal that has like a less phosphorus content in their manure, or is it pretty much all? Pretty I think high. Poultry is the lowest. Okay. Really. Hmm. Huh. Swine is high. 
most of the cattle you're going to find around here feed lot compost. Yeah, or these numbers are based on if you're feeding conventionally, though, isn't it? Not so much like we have grass fed pigs. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that would make a difference. Are you feed, what are, I guess, what is their total ration? Like a cup a day of the, of the, of the pig feed. Yeah, yeah, the corn soy feed so they don't eat grass. A cup a day's low. I know, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, it, it's an American it's guinea hog. They can live just on grass. Wow. Just um, there, I'm assuming, I'm assuming. So this is a lot of you're not weird you know, weirdos. Weirdos. Oh. <laughs> Bring more deviled eggs. Yeah. <laughs> um. In my brain, I'm automatically saying, "Oh yeah, they'll have less phosphorus." I can't tell you for certain. Well, I guess my question was just hey, the numbers yes. you're spouting right now are like the are based on conventional like yes. feedlot yeah. cattle. Yes. Yeah, you should get so, your, you should make compost and get it tested. Yeah, mm -hmm. we do make compost. We will get it tested now that we know how. Yeah. That's why we're here. Yes, um, a lot of our phosphorus is in the corn soy heavy diets, mm -hmm. and then we supplement it. And okay. if if you're middle, if you're giving extra minerals to cattle, it'll be in the phosphorus. Now that's where it'll we'll usually have phosphorus from. too. Yeah, okay. it'll usually be in their total mixed diets. Um, if you're not feeding those diets. My assumption so maybe is maybe we become like a manure company. There you go. There, you there go. is a uh, there is there, there a is market. A market. Yet? Yeah. There is all right. There's a market for that. Well, um, our neighbors will love it. Kat, do you want to wrap it up and um, maybe we can ask you some more questions, like as we kind of filter out, and yeah. um, just want to make sure we don't. Yes, you know, I yeah, already take anybody's time. Yeah, 15 well, minutes over. Um, <laughs> as you have all realized, I can talk a lot. Um, you should all feel bad for my family. Sometimes they get speeches about this and they don't want to. Um, yeah, a lot thank of you turkey so questions. Yeah, this is a great thing. <laughs> anyway, yes, thank you so much. Thank you. If you have any um, questions, comments, you need a site visit from Extension, you can feel free to contact me. Uh, my cell phone and email are on that front sheet. Um, there's also the website to Boulder County Extension. Um, we've got some really great extension agents in that office who are here to help. We are here from the university. We're here to extend any new research to you guys. Um, thank you all for putting up listening to me talk for two hours. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 And we're also going to have like a follow-up Zoom, recorded Zoom call between Kat and Helen. Yeah. Helen's getting I'm soil Helen. samples done yeah. on this farm. And so she's gonna kind of have a interface and go over her like actual soil test results um, with Kat and they'll kind of, you know, be able to do kind of like a mock what you guys would be doing on your farms. So cool. Yeah. So yeah, look out for that. But thank you so much for coming, you guys. Thanks really everybody.